Hey everyone, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. So, the day has come. After six months or so of waiting, a new stable release of 351 Elect firmware is now available. This includes the RG351P, M, V, as well as the RG351MP, which you see here. Now, if you're not familiar with this operating system, 351 Elec is primarily focused on ease of use. This is really great for beginners or people who just don't want to mess around with emulation settings. For the most part, they've pre-configured a lot of the settings that you would have to do yourself with a lot of other operating systems. So in this video, I'm going to focus primarily on new features and updates available in 351 Elec. But when it comes to performance, I don't expect to see a lot of new changes in performance with this particular chipset. At this point, the PSP, Nintendo 64, and Dreamcast performance that you're going to find here is about the best that you're going to find across the board. So this video will show you how to update to this new version of 351 Elect, which they're calling Pineapple Forest. And I'll also show you how to set everything up from scratch if you're just now getting into things. We've got a lot of ground to cover, so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, let's start by talking about what's new with this release. In addition to having RG351MP support, there's quite a lot of new features too. First, it's the fact that online updates are back. So now once you update to this release, you're going to be able to do everything over Wi-Fi from here on out. On top of that, there's a new save state manager, which I'll show off here in this video. And there's also a cloud save sync feature. That one's a little bit more in depth, so I'll probably have to do a dedicated video on that one. A couple other features include the fact that Drastic is now pre-installed onto the firmware, and they've also added the Moopin64 standalone emulator and a bunch of new cores as well. On top of that, they've updated the Doom engine to GZ Doom, and you can also use a new build engine for classic PC shooters like Shadow Warrior and Duke Nukem 3D. And finally, they have these new pre-configured bezels, which are really cool. I'll show off those in a minute. And they've also updated some of the themes and some of the configuration options as well. When it comes to changes and updates, they've updated RetroArch as well as most of the cores and emulators. They've also disabled Rumble for when you first start up the device. And there have been a couple tweaks to retro achievements, and across the board, games now start up faster. They've also included more usability options, so the volume works a lot better, you can just hold down on the button, and the brightness also gets more dim than it used to. And finally, they have a new way of sharing files across Wi-Fi using Samba Share. I'll show you how to do that here in this video as well. Okay, so let me show you how to update your device if you're already running an older version of 351 Elec. So for this example, I'm going to use my RG351M, which is using the previous release called Crazy Hedgehog. So all you need to do is make sure your device is turned off and then eject the SD card and put it into your computer. Next, you're going to want to go to the new 351 Elec website, and I'll show more about this website here later. But you want to go over to the download section and then find the upgrade download that's available for your device. And once you've downloaded that file, you just want to add it to the SD card. You want to put it in the game slash updates folder. And it's as simple as just dragging and dropping. After you've moved over that file, go ahead and eject the SD card. And then you can go ahead and put it back into your device. Now, once you turn the device on, it's going to automatically detect that you have that new file inside of that update folder. And that's going to prompt it to run the update script. This is going to take a few minutes, but after that, you're actually good to go. You now have an updated version of 351 Elec. So that's the easy one. Let's talk about building this from scratch. So say you have something like the RG351P or the RG351M. For these two devices, you're going to need just one SD card. I recommend a 128 gig SD card, but you could also go up to 256 or even 512. And these cards are going to hold the operating system as well as all your game files. Now, if you have an RG351MP or an RG351V, these actually have two different SD card slots. And so while you're still going to want to have a larger card to put all your game files on, you can also use a second card, a smaller one, to put the operating system on. That's going to allow you to differentiate between the game files as well as the system files. So what we're going to do is install the operating system on the first SD card. They call it TF1 on the device itself. And then on the second card, we're going to put the game files. That one's the TF2 card. And we're going to use the RG351MP as our example. So let's go back to that 351 Elect website. This is a brand new website here. I'm going to show you a little bit more details here later. But for now, let's just download the newest version of 351 Elect. Now, I'm making this video to coincide with the launch of this new 351 Elect release, so that's why you still see Crazy Hedgehog here. But by the time this video releases, it's going to say Pineapple Forest, and then here you can download the fresh install for the P and the M, or the V or the MP. So depending on the device you own, just go ahead and download the fresh install of the corresponding file. And like I said, this is going to look a little bit different when the video actually releases. But either way, once you've downloaded the file, we're ready to go. 
So let's open up an app called Belena Etcher. If you don't have this installed, I'll have it in the written guide in the video description. From there, just go ahead and navigate to that image file that you just downloaded, and then make sure you have that newer SD card inserted as well. I'm using the RD351MP, so I'm using a 16 gigabyte card right here. After that, just go ahead and hit the flash button. It's gonna ask you, do you really wanna do this? And you say, yeah, man, I wanna do it. And it'll take a minute to run through the process. It's gonna decompress the file and then flash it and then also validate it afterwards. But after that, you're done, and Belena Etcher is going to eject the SD card for you as well, so all you have to do is pull it out of your PC, and then put it into your device. If you're using an MP or a V, you're going to have two cards, but if you're using a P or an M, it's only going to have that one single card. After that, go ahead and turn on the device. From here, it's going to repartition the SD card, and also build out the folder structure so you can add your game files here in the next step. And once it boots into 351 Elect, you'll see there's not a lot of things you can do, and that's because we need to add the game files. So go ahead and press start to get into the main menu, then go to quit and shut down system. From here, let's go ahead and take out that larger SD card, put it back into our computer, and we can start adding some game files. Now, once you plug this card into your device, you're going to see a bunch of different game folders here. And these are the folders where we're going to put all of our games. And on the left here, you can see the games files that I have stored on my computer. I'm going to move these onto the SD card. Now, if you're not really sure what type of game files to use or where to put them, all that's covered in the 351 Elect website as well. What you want to do is go into that tab that says Systems up top. Within here, it's going to show you the system and the emulators, as well as all the different folders to put your game files in. So let's take one as an example. Let's go to Nintendo Entertainment System. Here you can see the name of the platform, and then also the three different available emulators, and the one that's in bold is the one they use by default. Next, you're going to see the name of the folder. That's where you're going to put your game files. And finally, on the right, you're going to see a list of all the game file types that are supported. So that's basically it. Make sure you have the correct file type and you put it in the correct folder. Now, in addition to game files, which you're going to have to find on your own, you're also going to want to add BIOS files. And these are system files that allow certain systems to run properly. You could either grab these from the card that came with your device, or you could find your own RetroArch BIOS pack and add them here. Either way, this is an important step to do for certain systems like Game Boy Advance and PlayStation 1. After that, it's just a matter of finding your game files and then moving them over. Like with BIOS files, I can't tell you where to get these game files. These are all copyrighted material. But it's as simple as taking your game files and moving them over to the corresponding folder. Here I'm moving over my Game Boy files, but I could also move over things like, say, NES. So I'll go to the NES folder, and then I'll grab my NES games, and I'll move them over into this folder. And that's basically it. This is all you really have to do. And every time you add the correct files to each of these folders, they're going to pop up on the operating system as you navigate it. Anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Let's go ahead and eject the SD card and put it into the device. Okay, so when we boot this up this time, let's actually record how long it takes to actually get to the operating system. And it looks like at this point it takes less than 18 seconds from the moment you press the power button to when you're actually navigating the menu. That's really fast. I think that's one of the fastest I've seen for any of these systems. Okay, first thing I want to talk about are the various things that you can configure about each of these menus, or themes as they call them in this device. Go ahead and press start to get into the menu and go into UI settings. Now what you can do is go into the theme configuration section, and then within here you can make all sorts of adjustments to the theme itself. So I recommend experimenting with this and seeing what things you can adjust to your liking. You can increase font size or change the different menu colors. One of my favorite things to do is to change the system view art. The full screen one looks pretty good, but I really like the one that's called centered. And that's what it looks like here. I really like this look. Okay, so now let's actually boot up a game and we'll talk a little bit about this experience as well. So if you go into your system like Game Boy and you start up a game, you can see it gives you the option to actually load it from a new game or an auto save state. Because we've never launched a game before, we don't have an auto save state, so we'll just start a new game. And let's also time how long it takes to start up a game in this one, and as you can see here, it takes a little less than 8 seconds to boot up. That also seems a lot faster than it used to. I remember when it used to take about 15 seconds. Now, this Game Boy game is shown in black and white, so let's see what we can do to fix that to make it a little bit more colored. What you want to do is press select to get into the view options, and then select advanced system configuration. And in here, at the very bottom, you can see there's a colorization option for Game Boy. And each of these options are going to be a different color scheme that's available. My favorite is called Special 1, so let's select that one. Now we'll go back and start up the game again, and we'll start a new game. And there you go, it now has a light green palette to it. This is one of my favorites here. So now let's talk a little bit about that autosave feature. If you go into the game settings here, you can see there's an option here that says autosave load on game launch. 
and right now it's selected to just show your save states every time you launch up a game. But if you wanted, you could just have it auto save and auto load every single time. You just set that to on. Or you have another option here that says show save states if it's not empty. Now that basically means that it's going to launch the game immediately if there are no save states, but if there are, it's going to give you that option. So let's try that one out. So say we start up a new game here, Contra Alien Wars on the Game Boy. And then once we're done playing, we hold on select and press start twice to get back to the main menu. Now, the next time we open it up, you can see there's an auto save. And this is basically made the last time we quit out of the game. So if we launch that, you can see we're exactly where we were before we turned it off. So that's a really handy feature if you want to try to just jump in and out of your games. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the different ways we can adjust the settings. The easiest one is just to press start and go into game settings. Now, if you make any settings changes here, it's going to affect every system on the device. And for the most part, I'm not going to recommend that you make any changes within this menu here. Because for the most part, you're going to want to make changes that are specific to a system. For example, you want to change an emulator for a system or specific colorization options. Now, there's a couple different ways you can get in that system menu, so let me show you those real quick. The first is to go back into that game settings section, and then you'll find a setting here that says per system advanced configuration. And within here, you can select your system and then make the changes there. But another way you can do that is actually within the systems menu itself. So say we go into the Game Boy Color section. Now, if we press the select button, we can select advanced system options. And now it's going to show us that same menu. These are all the Game Boy Color specific options. And within the decoration options section, you can change things like what system you want to show when you're showing your bezels. We're going to keep it on auto because that's going to show Game Boy Color. But if you wanted, you could also use game specific bezels. On top of that, you have some overlay options like a grid and a shadow effect. I'm going to leave all these on auto, but those are the changes you can make if you wanted to make them specific to the Game Boy Color. Now let's say you wanted to make some changes that were particular to one specific game. So for example with Mario Tennis. What you want to do is hover over the game and then press the X button. And then here select Advanced Game Options. This is going to show you that same menu we've seen before, but this is specific to the Mario Tennis game on the Game Boy Color. So, say we go back to that Decoration Options section, and then we select a game-specific bezel. If we scroll down, you'll see that there is a Mario Tennis option. So we're going to pick Mario Tennis GB. Then we're going to close out of this menu. And now, when we start up Mario Tennis on the Game Boy Color, it's going to have its own game-specific bezel. And here it is right here, and it looks great. Now, not every game is going to have bezels, but a lot of them do, and this is a really neat feature, and this is specific to 351 Elec. So now I can play Mario Tennis with Mario Tennis specific bezels, but because I did game specific settings, none of the other games are going to be affected by the changes that I've made. And most of the handheld systems like Game Boy and Game Gear now have these pre-configured bezels and they look really nice. And the reason why these systems have bezels is because they don't scale very well when they're blown up to full screen. Let me give you an example with Super Nintendo, and I've shown this one off on a couple videos already. But basically, with Mega Man X on the Super Nintendo, if you look at his life bar, you can see it's a little bit imbalanced, and that's because when it's scaled up to do the full screen on this display, it doesn't have perfect integer scaling. So there's a couple different ways you can change this. You could do integer scaling, which is going to make the image look a little bit smaller, which is what they did for the Game Boy and other systems. Or you could use something like game filters or shaders. So let's go in, press X, and then go into Advanced Game Options. And within here, you can see there's a list of different shaders that are available. Now, there happen to be a ton of these, and some of these are not very good at all. But a couple that are very good are one called Band Limit Pixel, and another one called Sharp Bilinear 2x Prescale. So we're going to try the Sharp Bilinear 2x Prescale one first. So I'm going to exit out of the menu here, and then I'm going to start up my autosave here. And as you can see, the life bar is now fixed. It's perfectly balanced. With that being said, the image itself is a little bit blurry, so let's try something else instead. Let's try a filter. So I'm going to turn off that shader, and I'm going to go into the filter section. And filters work a lot like shaders, but they're a little bit more CPU intensive. I'm going to use this one here called Normal 2x, and then this one works best when you turn on bilinear filtering as well. So I'm going to go up to bilinear filtering and turn this one on. Once I've made those changes, I'm going to back out, start up the game again with the autosave. And here we are, we're back into the game, and as you can see, the life bar is also balanced again, but it's just a little bit sharper than that shader was. Now, like I mentioned, filters are a little bit more CPU intensive, so certain Super Nintendo games are not going to work well with this. But as you can see here, Mega Man X is still running at a solid 60 frames per second, even with this filter enabled. So if you get any sort of slowdown with any other Super Nintendo game, 
then you may have to turn this filter off. But for Mega Man X, it's working great. Now, another thing that's really important with certain systems is to choose the right emulator. So for Nintendo 64, that can make a big difference when it comes to performance. So let's go into the advanced system configuration here and look at all the emulator options we have available for 351 Elec. As you can see, there are four different RetroArch options, as well as two Retro Run options, as well as two different standalone emulators. The one I prefer to use is the bottom one here. This is standalone Mubin 64 with the Rice backend. And unfortunately, this emulator will not show you the frames per second, but I can tell you from the music that this game is running at full speed. And this is about the best performance you're going to get for Nintendo 64 on any of the different firmwares. Another firmware I really like on this device is called ArcOS, and it also runs the same emulator. So I would say at this point, the performance between these two firmwares is about equal. And that's pretty awesome because no matter what firmware you decide to use, you're gonna have great performance. Okay, so now let's talk about a little bit of the options you have available when it comes to networks. One of the new features in this newest release is something called Samba sharing. If you look here under the network settings, you have a host name and this is RG351MP. Now what we can do is use this host name to connect directly to the device when it's connected to the network. So while the device is still running, I'm going to go back onto my PC, and in this window here, I'm going to type in RG351MP. That's the host name. And as you can see here, I'm connected directly to the device. No need to FTP or use a password or anything else like that. If it does ask you for a password, just go ahead and type the word guest. This is really handy if I want to add a new game ROM without having to take out the SD card. Now, while I'm still connected to the network here, there's a couple other things I could do. For example, I can go into the updates and download section, and this is where I would go to update the device itself. You can use the update channel to download a new release if they have one available. You can also go in here and download new themes. So if you want to try out a different theme other than the one that comes initially with 351 Elec, this is where you can go to download new themes. There's also a package installer section, but this one's actually being phased out according to the developers, and that's because Portmaster is kind of replacing that. So let me show you how to use Portmaster. Back on that 351 Elec website, if you go into the Systems tab, you'll find a Portmaster option on the left. And Portmaster is a project by the developer of ArcOS, but they've also made it compatible with a lot of 351 Elec. As you can see from this table, almost every port that's available also works on 351 Elec too. And so if you want to try out any of these ports, you can actually go to the right here and select Portmaster Instructions, and it'll take you to the Portmaster webpage, and it'll show you specifically what game data files are required in order to run that port. And so it's a pretty easy system once you have Portmaster installed. And the number of games that are supported is growing almost every day. Unfortunately, the one that's not working is Moonlight Game Streaming, so you're not able to stream games from your computer onto 351 Elec. But other than that, for the most part, all the other games from Portmaster are now working on 351 Elec as well. So let me show you real quick how to put Portmaster on your new 351 Elec install. First things first is download the Portmaster file from this main page here, and then navigate to wherever you saved it on your computer. From there, go ahead and put your SD card into your device, and then go into the port section, and then all you basically have to do is just move over this Portmaster folder into the Ports folder. Now I've already done it, so I'm just going to skip this part here, but that's basically all you have to do to install Portmaster. Then put the card back into your device, navigate to the port section, and there you can find Portmaster. Make sure you're connected to the internet, and then you can start it right up. And within here, you can pick whatever game you want to install the base files for. For the most part, this won't install the actual game, but it'll install all the game folders you need, and then you'll put your data files inside of that. So for example, I'm going to download Cannonball. This is an outrun port that's available in Portmaster. Once I have it installed, I just need to move over my game data files, and then I can boot up the game. And all I did was follow the instructions that were in the Portmaster website. And this process will give you access to over 50 different ports, everything from Freedom Planet to Space Cadet Pinball. Do you guys remember this game from the early Windows days, Space Cadet Pinball? Man, I used to love this game. And it's actually really fun to play on these devices too. Okay, one other feature that I thought is worth mentioning. If you have an RG351P or an M, one of those that only have one SD card, you can actually take your 351 Elect card and put it in the second SD card slot of the RG351V. And now, when you boot this up, it's actually going to read that 351 Elect card as if it was a second SD card. What this means is that if you're going to upgrade into the RG351V from one of the other devices, you're actually going to be able to preserve all of your games as well as all of your saves. And so, if you happen to own two of these devices, you could swap the card between the two devices and maintain your saves. 
or it would give you a really easy path to upgrade to the RG351V. Now this also works in the RG351MP, but it hasn't been tested as much, so the developers are a little bit hesitant to say that it works fully. Either way, I thought that was a pretty cool feature. Alright everyone, I'm going to wrap things up here. I know I've been slamming you with a bunch of information here, but I just want to reiterate one more time that the 351 Elect website is going to be your best bet when it comes to any sort of questions you have about this firmware. They spent months updating this website and getting every little thing that you could ever think about all together on one page. And I gotta say, it's really well done. They've got nice hotkey maps and all sorts of different menus to talk you through all of the different options that you have available within 351 Elect. So if you have any questions, I would recommend going to this website or checking out their Discord server, which I'll also have linked in my written guide in the video description. Anyway, that's about it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I'm pretty excited about this new version of 351 Elec. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, this is one of the easiest firmwares to jump right into. And that's because they've made everything so easy to configure right there in Emulation Station. So let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful. And we will see you next time. Happy gaming.